doing right was figuring out how do you encode or how could you encode integer data, right? And we saw that there were there were sort of two different ways to do it, uh, whether or not you took into account sign or not. And if you encountered, so let's just do this. Um, We could do this as unsigned or signed, and uh, we were just for the sake of demonstration using 8 bits. Okay, so for 8 bits, We can encode 256 total things with 8 bits, and if we don't take into account the side of the number, if we just say they're all positive, then that gets us everybody from 0 to 255. Okay, great. Uh, if we do this in the sign system, here, let me do, let me um, not use minus signs. Okay, um, and let's go into a, just a smidge more detail about the range of these things. Negative 128 to negative 1, oops. All of the ones that have a one in their far leftmost bit position. Um, so all of those encodings uh, represent the negatives. Okay, and we saw that there was there were two uh, some special encodings. Okay, so 128 or sorry, negative 128. What was weird about that number? Birthday boy back there. Do you remember what was weird about minus 128? Yeah, so when you flip the bits and you add 1, you take the 2's complement of what you think represents minus 128, you get the exact same thing back. And that's weird, because you would think that there's only one such number that does that, namely 0, okay? But in, in clock arithmetic, there's really two of them, okay? So, a little weird, but whatever. Um, and then it turns out that negative 1, was anybody born on the 1st? Of the when we were doing the birthday thing last week, no, nobody in this room was born in the first. Okay, well, anyway, uh, well, what's one encoding in how do you encode one? It'd be all zeros on the one in the last position, right? So if you flip all those bits and you add one, you get all ones, right? Okay, so ff in hex. Um, and then the, so those are all the negative encodings, and then 0 to 127 are encodings uh, 0x00 through 0x, what should I, what should go here? What's the, what's 127 in hex? Yeah? Okay, anyway. All right, so that's what we can do in the integer system. Uh, so what I want to talk about starting today, and we'll we'll continue and finish this on Wednesday, uh, is how do we do non-whole numbers? So the problem, of course, is I don't have any way to encode the dot, right? So if I want to encode 1.5 or 3.14 or some floating point number like that, or some, you know, non-whole number, how do I say where the dot's going to be? I don't know, right? Okay, and the other problem, of course, is that uh, numbers on the computers, 
we're going to encode these things with the fixed number of bits. Now, like with integers, we have to make a choice as to how many that is, 8, 16, 32, etc. Okay. Um, and then we have to say, okay, how do we split those bits into the different parts of sort of a, a decimal looking number? Okay. Uh, so in order to kind of motivate this, think to yourself for a moment. Think up, write down the biggest, um, the biggest number that you can think of, okay, and also the smallest positive number that you can think of, right? So uh, obviously the smallest negative number you could think of would be just the same as kind of thinking of the biggest number. You just put a minus sign out front, okay? But think of the smallest positive, so point oh 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 whatever something, okay? So does the question make sense? All right, so just talk amongst yourselves for a moment, and let's see what we can come up with um, on the biggest and the smallest numbers. Okay, now, to be clear, is there a small list positive number in math class? No. Is there a smallest positive number in computing? Once you pick a number of bits, yes, there is. Okay, that's a little weird, but, well, you'll, you'll get over it. So after the caffeine is kicked in and your brains are now working, All right, any nominations for the biggest? Hmm? Any nominations for a really big number? Here, let me do a uh, dot thingy. Huh? 255. What? 255. Two, five, five. Okay, that is a big number. It's the biggest you can encode as an integer with eight bits, okay? But surely you can outdo 255. Okay, so forget the computer, right? Just think of the biggest damn number you can come up with. A trillion. Okay. Oh, okay. We can play that game all day. Let's 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 go up. Do better, huh? What? Huh? That's not a number, huh? Infinity is not a number. It's an eight sideways. That doesn't make it a number. I mean, I could write a five sideways. Does that make that a number? <laughs> okay, no, to, to be clear, infinity is not a number, okay, uh, because if it were, well, what is infinity plus one? It's still infinite, infinity, right? So it doesn't obey, it's, it's not a number in the same sense as uh, regular numbers, okay? So if you want to be really technical about it, we call that a transfinite number, okay? And there, you can do arithmetic with these things, but the system is really bonkers. Okay. Uh, yeah. Huh? Oh, that is a big number. A Google, and that's an even bigger number. Okay. Uh, 
a Googleplex is one followed by a trillion zeros. Okay, so it's at an obscenely big number. I'm surprised that nobody has uh, taken uh, the opportunity here uh, because, for example, I, I think the biggest number I can think of would be the weight of Cody's mom in kilograms. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh 60 uh, okay all right um how many of you guys are in biology or chemistry oh surely you can come up with some big numbers from there like from chemistry what should be our favorite yeah Avogadro's number, okay. Uh, well, since we're live streaming, I'll, I'll refrain from my obvious, uh, obvious insult of Cody with the smallest number. You, I'm sure, can all think of what I'm thinking of. Um, but <laughs> um, what, what other small numbers could we think of? Huh? Okay, well, we can think of like the universal gravitational constant, which uh, I'm not remembering what it is right now, but let's just look it up real quick. Um, so let's look, look up this number. Okay, so this is a really small number. All right, 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 11. We'll call it good there. Okay, all right, so what was sort of the, the thing that you guys didn't think of until I sort of prodded you is what's a common way to express either really big or really small numbers? Yeah, in scientific notation, right, as something times 10 to the something, okay? And it turns out this is exactly the kind of idea that we're going to use for doing this in binary. The only difference would be if I do scientific notation, it's something times 10 to the something. What is this, that going to be for us? Not 10, but rather 2, because we're doing everything in binary, okay? So essentially, floating point, the standards for this are base two style scientific notation. Okay? All right, so a couple of pieces of terminology. Um, the mantissa is the stuff that follows the decimal point. Okay? Uh, that's just the, oops, the name that we've got for it. The exponent, well, duh. That's the, so 10 to the 23rd, 23 is the exponent. And then we're going to rename the decimal point. Okay, and we call it the radix. Uh, it means root in Latin. Um, and the reason that we call it something different than decimal point, well, when you say decimal, doesn't that kind of immediately conjure a base 10 kind of a system? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the more generic term, uh, if it's if you're not assuming that we're working base ten, is radix. Okay. So we'll use that. But basically, it's the dot. Okay. Now let's think back here for a moment to our two numbers that we wrote in scientific notation. Okay. What's sort of the convention about how I wrote these things? Okay, so for example, could I have written this So could I have written Avogadro's number that way? It's the same number, right? Would I have ever actually written it like that? Okay, why not? What's the convention? For scientific notation. Yeah. 
Oh, did I? Yeah, sorry. Okay, that's what I meant. Um, all right, that said, uh, what would I ever write Avogadro's number that way instead of the other way? Basically, no. There's only one situation I'd ever do this in, and it's if I was trying to add this number to another scientific uh, notation style number. Okay, But the convention for scientific notation is how many digits go before the decimal point? Precisely one. Okay, and can that number that's in front of the decimal point ever be a zero? No, because if it were, I would just shift the decimal point over one spot and change the exponent. Okay, so for example, right, I would not write 0 0.1 times 10 to the third. What I would write instead is 1 times 10 to the second. Okay, or if I want to be pedantic about it, 1.0. Okay, so does that make sense that the convention uh, that we just all use for scientific notation is precisely one digit before the radix and however many after it are you need, uh, and the digit that's before the radix is never a zero. Okay, because if it is, I could always just do this, shift everything over. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so let's go to binary land. How many things can go uh, in front of the decimal point or the radix? Precisely one digit, and it can't be a zero. So what does that mean? It has to be a one. Because in binary, there are only two digits that we can work with, right? Zero and one. Okay, so what this means is do I actually really have to write down that one? No, because it's always there. Okay, and that'll become important on the computer side of this in a minute. Okay, all right, so in binary land, the digit, or really the bit, The bit before the radix is always a 1. Okay, there is one exception to this, and it's when you're encoding the number 0, but that, that's okay. Right, because what do you think the binary, uh, sorry, the floating point encoding for 0 is? It's just all zeros. Okay. Um, excuse me. Okay, so the bit before the radix is always a 1. Okay, and... Um, that means that we don't actually have to write that bit down because we know it's all, always there. Okay, so in a sense, we get a bit for free. Okay? All right. So first off, let's just take a number um, and think about how we would start to encode it. Okay? So if I took a number like 2.5, Okay, let's start to write that in sort of binary style scientific notation. Okay, so first off, uh, what I need to do is just write it as a, um, a string of ones and zeros. Okay, so would you guys accept that this, oops, is that thing in binary? Okay, what's two? How do I encode two in binary? One zero, okay. Then I've got the radix, okay. Now in, in uh, base 10, when you start to go to the right of the radix, what are the place values? What's the first spot immediately after the radix? So the point five here, the five is in which position? The tenths place, and then the next one would be the hundredths and so on, okay. So if I'm doing this in binary, what's that first position? Not the tenths, but rather the, I can't hear, I'm sorry. Hundreds? No? The, uh, one is the digit that I've put there, but what's the place value of it? Well, what's the place value of the zero? It's in the ones place. 
What's the place value of this one? It's in the twos place, right? And then what would be one more spot over? Fours. Oh, you guys need some coffee. Jeez, right? All right, so what are the place values? One, two, four, eight, 16, 32, and so on, right? So if I go the other direction, what should this, this one is in the what's place? The, the tooths? <laughs> is that what you said? The halves place. Okay. What about the space after it? Quarters, then eighths, then sixteenths, and so on. Okay. So does that make sense? Okay. You will probably never ever hear me say something like this again, but for once, I'm glad that we're in America and we're all used to, well, most of us are used to using inches right? Because how do you subdivide an inch? Halves, quarters, eighths, sixteenths, right? So, you know, if I tell you to go get a five sixteenth socket out of the toolbox, you're like, oh, okay, no problem. And you go get the appropriate tool, right? So it's uh, basically the same thing here. Now, for our metric country friends, I'm sorry, Imperial units are stupid. Um, yeah, but we're in America, so we have to use freedom units. Um, yeah, sorry. What do they use in India? Is it metric or do, is still a holdover of British units? Me fully metric, 100%? Okay, well. I guess that doesn't surprise me because it's yet another way that you could have the country could give the British a finger, but <laughs> uh, anyway. Oh yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll use basically any measurement system but the metric system. Like I, I saw like a, a meme going around Facebook, and it was something like a, a sinkhole opened up in Main Street. It was the size of about six washers across and it's just like uh, you know did we really have to use the washer as a system of measurement but whatever yeah. uh, okay so I would encode or I would write this thing down as 10 or sorry 10.1 okay now are we all clear that that really means 2.5 okay how would I add this up well I have a zero in the ones place I have a one in the twos place and what do I have in the halves place? Huh? Oh, okay. There's a cricket. Great. Your assignment after class is to take him outside. Up outside. Alive. If it's not alive, no. Cricket doesn't need to die. Well, all right, so 10.1. Okay, now how am I going to write that in sort of scientific notation style? How would I write this? I would write it as 1.01 .01 times 2 to the what? Okay, two to the first. Why two to the first? Yeah, exactly. So if I take this, the radix in my scientific uh, notation style writing, okay, how many positions do I need to shift it in order to get it to where it was over here? One position to the right, okay, and so that means that my exponent needs to be a one. If I wanted to shift it one position to the left, what would I make that exponent? be a negative one okay so what's the convention moving the radix to the right is tantamount to multiplying by two and to the left is by dividing by two okay so let me give you give you guys let's let's have story time with the, with uncle McKinney uh, so you guys are all in college college students 
are sort of obliged to work a crappy job, right, in order to uh, make money, and then you never have the crappy job again, hopefully. So what are y'all's crappy jobs? Working with fireworks, that doesn't sound so crappy. Uh, serving. Serving where? Okay, okay, so you're a waiter, right? Yeah, food service industry sucks, okay? Does anybody else wait tables? All right, what about working in retail? Yeah, okay, where have you worked in retail? Oh, okay. There's such a thing? Oh. Yeah, where is this? Huh. I never knew there was such a thing. Okay. So, what sucks about working in retail? I mean, other than everything. Right. But, huh? See, I actually like that part. Yeah, okay, 5% of them I wanted to drop kick to the moon, right? Those 5%, most of it, yeah. So, okay, so when I was in college, I also worked in retail. I worked at Kohl's. I was employee number 1245936. Uh, and I still have that number memorized because, well, I'll get there. Um, so Kohl's, right? So I started as a truck unloader. That was actually really nice. It was like, five hours of paid exercise, okay, unloading boxes off of a truck. Well, but there's only so many hours you can get doing that. So then I got trained to be a cashier also for extra hours. My mother actually was the one who trained me on the cash registers. That was kind of hilarious. Um, and, uh, but I didn't last very long on the cash registers. Can you guess why? How many of you guys have been to Kohl's in the last month? or two, okay? Why, why was I not the, I was an efficient cashier. I got people rung out quickly, but what did I, what was I not good at? Huh? Oh, come on. Huh? No, I, I was fine with that. And of course, most people, though, the whole, the whole goal of being at the cashier station is to not handle cash because what you want is for them to be using the store credit card. Oh, you don't have a calls charge, sir? Well, if you apply for one right now, we can save you 10%, and I'll even give you a 10% coupon for the next time. Right? So they push the credit card, right? I was not, so very, not very good at that. Uh, and I also was smart and could solve problems. That meant that I instantly ended up in customer service, okay? Uh, which, okay, whatever. So one day, I'm working at Kohl's. It's... Uh, just after Christmas, okay? So everybody is returning and exchanging things that don't fit and whatever. And uh, so I have a break, and I'm kind of walking around out on the sales floor. And a uh, lady comes up to me, and she says, so all of the Christmas stuff is 90% off, right? And I'm like, yes, ma'am, right? It's right after Christmas. We want to get the stuff to get the hell out of the store. Okay, and she said, can you tell me how much this is? Okay, now, to be fair, that's not always an easy question in retail, right? Okay, but if the store says this is 90% off, what do they mean? 90% off of what? The original price, which is the thing on the barcode, right? The MSRP, okay? So... She hands me a thing that says it's twenty nine ninety nine, then, and it's ninety percent off. How much is it? Yeah, two ninety nine. Okay, how did you do that so quickly? Well, ninety percent off means that it's ten percent of, and how do you quickly divide or multiply a number by ten? You just move the decimal point. All right, that's easy. Okay, so she's happy. Off she goes. About 10 minutes later, she finds me, and she has a cart full of stuff. And she said, can you tell me how much all of this stuff is? 
I'm like, sure. And so I'm like, you know, two, 250, but just burning through this pile. And she looks at me and she's like, wow, how are you doing this so quickly? Right? I'm like, well, well ma'am, 90% off means 10% of, so I'm just moving the decimal point one spot to the left. She's like, wow, you must be really good at math. And I'm like, well, I am a math major, but I also passed elementary school. So um, I didn't say that, obviously, because <laughs> um, that would have been, you know, gotten me in trouble. Uh, okay, anyway, so moving the radix in base 10, like at the price tag at Kohl's, is effectively either multiplying or dividing by 10. Okay, uh, and we encode that with the exponent, right? So the exponent is how many positions you need to move the radix. Positive for one way and negative for the other. And you just do whatever, whichever one you need. Okay, so, uh, so this is why I would write what we started with is 10.1, okay, meaning two, no ones, and a one half, as 1.01 .01 times two to the first, okay? Because what's our rule about scientific style notation and coding? What goes before the radix? Okay, a single digit. Now, in binary, what does that digit always have to be? A 1, because there's no other option. It can't be a 0, so it must be a 1. And you killed the cricket. He rolled over it by... Okay. Yeah. All right, let us all take a moment of silence to remember Clyde. Clyde the cricket. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, right. All right, so now what we have to do is, when we write this, we're just writing it, right? But I still haven't encoded it for storage on a computer, okay? So that's the next part of this that we need to talk, is how do we actually encode this? Okay, so, um, there are three things that we need to encode. Okay? The sign, the exponent, and the mantissa. Okay, the sign is what in this case? It's a positive, okay. And the, uh, the convention is that we'll use zero to indicate a positive number and one to indicate a negative number, okay? Uh, we need to encode the exponent, and so in, um, what's our exponent in this case? One, okay? And then what's our mantissa? So this is, what's the mantissa again? It's the stuff that's after the radix. Zero, one. Okay. So we have these numbers, and we're going to do something with them in a second. Okay. So the one thing that we haven't done yet is to say, how many bits am I going to spend on each piece of this number, right? Well, let's start with the easy one. How many bits do I need to store the exponent? or sorry, not the exponent, the sign. Well, how many things could the sign be? Zero or one, that's a single bit, okay? So we'll spend one bit on our sign. Okay, that's easy. The exponent and the mantissa, well, we have some choices here, okay? And what do you think the advantage of using more bits for these things would be? Okay, so if I said I'm going to use 100 bits for the exponent and 1,000 bits for the mantissa, what's the benefit potentially of doing that? Yeah, you, can, you get more precision, okay? However, the downside is that then you're storing a lot of bits, okay? And the, this is a really good question. 
how many bits do you, or sorry, how many decimal points do you need to be sort of good enough? Okay. All right. So let me uh, pop open a little website here um, that I think you guys will kind of like. Okay, and I need to not put the space in because otherwise we get floaty toys. There we go. Okay, so this is called Float Toy. Uh, it's written by a guy named um, Evan something or other, Evan W. Okay, and so when you load it, okay, here's what you're given. So there are a number of different stand, well, there's a standard for floating point, okay? And this is all given by a, a standard um, document called IEEE 754, okay? So the IEEE is a, um, a professional organization for electrical engineers and computer people and, and whatnot. And there are a number of different standards that they ratify uh, and some of these things, like the USB standard, right, for how USB communication works, that's an IEEE standard, right? So there's a bunch of these things, and you guys are using them all every day, even if you didn't know that that's what the standards were. Okay, so IEEE 754, which was first sort of officially ratified in the mid-80s, uh, defines how floating point numbers would be stored in a computer. Now, people had been doing floating point before this, but there wasn't necessarily a uniform system, right? So computer manufacturer A might have handled things a little differently than computer manufacturer B, and as you can imagine, this could cause problems, right, with intercommunication. Uh, and so standardized around sort of the most logical way to do this, and the standard that it defined was the 32-bit standard, okay? And then we could also define a 64-bit standard and a 16-bit standard, okay? Now, when we go back over to the, the, the uh, document we're working on, we're actually going to do this with 8 bits to really just kind of force uh, a couple of interesting things to happen. Nobody in their right mind would ever actually use 8 bits for a floating point number. It's just you don't get enough precision out of it for it to be worth it. Okay, the smallest precision that anybody uses in the real world is the 16-bit half precision. Um, and, uh, but for most purposes, people use either 32 or 64-bit floats. Okay, um, so when you load it up, he's got the encodings here for pi, 3.141592, blah, 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 uh, expressed as a 16, 32, and 64-bit number. And we'll talk through why these encodings are what they are in a second, because there's some surprises. Um, but to our question, all right, this is pi to, what is it, like 15 digits or so? Right, that's a fair number of digits. Does anybody happen to know pi to more digits than that? You used to, like in high school, did you have it memorized out to... The most, yeah, okay. So, um, yeah. So that's that's a you know pretty reasonable uh, number of digits for pi. Would we agree? So that's actually the value that NASA da uses when they're calculating uh, interplanetary space flight. Okay, and being off by one digit in the very end of this. So if that last bit was nine two or nine four. Uh, basically is like being off by an inch if you are going from here to Pluto. Right, which is, I mean, if you're going from here to Pluto and you're off by an inch, I think if the, you're doing just fine. Okay, so 64-bit double precision uh, is pretty damn precise, okay, uh, and is enough for, well, like I said, sending space probes to Pluto. Okay, so we don't really need to use that much more precision than this um, for almost any circumstance that we could imagine. 
Uh, now, there is a 128-bit quad precision standard, uh, but it, it's only really used in very, very, um, like, ultra um, hardcore science-y, like you're, you're trying to model like atoms and stuff, right? So it's 64-bit it, is, is basically enough. Uh, okay, but all of these standards have a couple of things in common. The first is the order, okay? The sign bit is always the far left bit, okay? Uh, and followed by the exponent bits, followed by the mantissa bits. So the order is always sign, exponent, mantissa. All right, now what's different about them? Obviously, they all have a different number of bits, okay? How many do all of them use for the sign? Just one bit, and that makes sense, right? Because the number is either positive or it isn't, okay? Um, what about for the exponent and the mantissa? Well, let's just start with the exponent. How many positions do we have for the exponent in the 16-bit scheme? Five. And in the 32-bit uh, scheme, eight. All right, there are eight green boxes here. Okay, and then how many in the 64-bit? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay. Okay, so those are just the, the standards. Uh, fine, and then everything else we spend on our mantissa. Okay. So, um, right. Okay, so these are the 16, 32, and 64-bit versions, uh, but let's go back and, and look at the simplest version that we could do here, which is 8 bits. Okay, and the convention for 8 bits, well, a, a convention is not a very good way to put it. Um, so there is no 8-bit standard, right, because nobody would ever actually use that. Okay, so the 8-bit standard that we're going to talk about is basically saying, all right, if I take what's common about all of the IEEE uh, 754 uh, encodings and look at, okay, if they were to do 8 bits, how would it work? That's what we'll do, okay? Just because it's simple enough to get our hands on. Okay, and the convention is this. One sign bit, three exponent bits, and four mantissa bits. That has the advantage of adding up to eight, okay? Um, and so that's how many we'll use. Okay, so if I go back to the number that we're working with, what's the sign bit here for the 2.5 number that we're doing? Zero, okay, so what's the convention? One indicates negative, zero indicates positive. Is that a little backwards? Uh, maybe, but if we think back up to what we were doing last time, uh, when we're encoding things in as integers, what was the far left bit being one indicate? Yeah, for the negatives, the far left bit being a one indicates that the number's negative. So this is at least consistent with that, okay? Uh, which is maybe a good thing. Uh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That's why. Yeah, okay. Because I'm incompetent. Okay. Let's, uh, we'll wait on the mantissa for a second. What, or sorry, the exponent. What's the mantissa? What did we have before? Okay, but how many bits am I going to spend on this? Four. So I can't just write zero, 01. I have to have four bits. Okay. Is that okay? So this would be kind of like um, could I write down 2.50? Do I need to write that zero down? No. But let's say that I was forcing myself to use exactly a certain number of digits then if I didn't need that digit, I just have to put a zero there, okay? Uh, okay, now the exponent is a little funny, okay? And this is going to drive you guys crazy, and I'm sorry. What is the exponent? It's the, the number one, okay? How would I encode that with three bits? I would write this, 
right? Zero, zero, one. Okay? Are we cool with that? But this is not actually what I'm going to store. Okay, my exponents are what we call biased. Okay, and this is the part that's going to drive you guys at, at first a little bit crazy. The exponent that I actually store is three bigger than what it is. Okay, so the, excuse me, the exponent I wanted to write down was zero, zero, 001. But what I'm going to store is that plus three. Okay. This plus three is what we call a bias. Okay. Now, you might say, why the hell are we doing that? There's a good reason for it that I don't think I can really explain right this instant. I think we need to talk about some more stuff first. Okay. But there's a good reason for, for that bias. Um, okay. So what I will actually store is one zero zero. Okay. The exponent that I wanted plus the bias. Now, what this means is that on the encoding side, you have to add three. And if I handed you a floating point number, an encoding, you would have to subtract three. Okay? And you've got to be careful which direction you're going, that you add in the correct direction and you subtract in the other direction. Okay? Uh, is that okay for now? Okay. So, with, with that one caveat, this weird bit about this, this offset... Are we clear with what we've got? First off, the sign bit. That, that's easy. Okay? It's a zero positive number. The exponent, it being one, makes sense. And then, of course, we've got this weird offset, so it becomes one, zero, zero. Okay? And the mantissa, are we clear why it's zero, one, zero, zero? Okay? Good? All right. So now let's put it all together. And what do we get? We get 0 for the sign, 1, 0, 0 for the exponent, 0, 1, 0, 0 for the mantissa. Okay? And let me, um, let me maybe kind of color code these things. Ah, okay. Well, um, the sign is 0. Zeros for positive. Uh, so remember, I had a one right here earlier. That was a mistake. Yeah, sorry. So so go back and fix that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's just make sure we're clear. Zero sign bit indicates a positive number. One indicates a negative number. Two point five is a positive number. Last time I checked. So the sign bit here is a zero. Okay. Um, all right. So as an eight bit number. Uh, this is what we would have, okay? So let's color code these the same way that Evan did here. Blue for sign, green for exponent, and red for mantissa. Okay, so let's do blue for sign. Uh, what was it? Green for exponent. Green for exponent. And red for mantissa. Okay. All right, so that's our 8-bit encoding of this number. Okay, so is that all right? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, how did 0, 0, 001 plus 3 equal 100? Zero, zero? Well, what does 0, 0, 001 represent? 1, right? What's 1 plus 3? What's 4 in binary? Right? Yeah, okay, so is that all right? All right, now, it's uh, the, the exponent here, or the bias is three. Okay, now, um, I think what we'll do uh, next time just for edification is let's do the same thing, okay? But let's do it, well, two different versions here. One, this is an 8-bit encoding which is sort of made up. Let's figure out how the 16 and 32 and 64-bit encodings would look. 
Okay, there's going to be some suspicious similarity, which I think you guys will like, but also some differences. Okay, uh, and then the other thing is, let's figure out how accurate we can get pi with 8 bits. And the answer is not very. Okay, which is interesting. Um, all right, so we'll continue with this on Wednesday. Um, yeah. Now, I guess one thing that uh, I should point out, just real quick, uh, this he's got the source code for this on GitHub, and he had to hand code all the 16-bit stuff, but his source code's there. And so what's stopping me from putting the 8-bit version up here? Well, I just need to sit down and do it. So anyway, all right, be gone.